When I was a kid, before they put in the Cumberland Gap Tunnel, there was a horrible winding road that went over the mountains from Kentucky into Tennessee. Pretty much a straight shot through the Cumberland Gap National Historic Park. I can barely remember it because I was so young when the tunnel officially opened. Six or seven, I forget. But there's one stretch of the old road that my brain won't let me forget. Overshadowed by the trees and built into the jut of a rock that caused a kink in the road, there was a door. A normal, average, you'd see it on a house door with a little brass knob. It always irked me because I was, and still am, very much the type of person who doesn't like to not know things. And that door became a mystery to end all mysteries. One of the most vivid memories I have about it is the first time I asked exactly what it was and where it went to. Sitting in the back seat of my mom's car, while stuck in standstill traffic, while mom was more concerned about the bumper-to-bumper -bumper crunch of cars that couldn't get past the wreck up the way, I was tiredly asking about the door, repeatedly. Like her initial answer of, I don't know, didn't count. Other people thought they knew. Everyone had an idea, or a theory, or they heard somebody talk about knowing somebody who knew somebody who'd been in there. I heard a dozen different stories from a dozen different people over the course of my childhood. It was where they hid munitions for World War II. It was where soldiers hid during the Revolutionary War. It was where bootleggers had once hid their stash. It was where Native Americans had lived before they were driven out of the area. It was an entrance into a cave system that was in the park. Or where they kept controls for things like lights and cameras. I personally liked my own theory, that there were Neanderthals inside who stayed up late making cave paintings of horses, which made as much sense as anything else anyone told me. In time though, the tunnel was finished and the old road was destroyed. The door was forgotten, like so many other childhood memories, and I became convinced that I dreamt up the whole thing. It happens. Kids having vivid imaginations and false memories are pretty common. That was until my best friend decided we were going to have a day of fun at the park. Kayla was my polar opposite, the definition of an early 2000s popular preteen girl. She liked makeup, boys, and Britney Spears, and wasn't much of an outdoorsy type. Meanwhile, I was obsessed with Digimon and Dirt. We were an unlikely duo whose childhood was spent compromising in weird ways, and the trip to the park was her way of making it up to me for a marathon of teen chick flicks. She knew I wasn't thrilled about Mary-Kate and Ashley, so she'd take the drive and go catch tadpoles with me as sort of a concession. It was a double concession since, having hit the age where looks, friends, and social etiquette suddenly began to matter, it was pretty obvious that she was becoming more and more hesitant to be seen in public with me. This was probably the reason why, when we got to the park, she specifically asked to be dropped off at the not-so-popular entrance to the trail. Rather than my favorite starting point on the Iron Furnace Trail, there was less of a chance that one of her crushes or school buddies would catch wind of us. Not that they'd be hanging out in the woods, anyway. Her grandpa wasn't the keenest on this since he didn't like the idea of us being so far away from people, but she managed to convince him by citing that civilization was literally down the hill from us if something happened. A big hill, sure, but you could technically see the roofs of the houses from the road just off of the parking lot. It was close enough. He hesitantly agreed and drove away with a sigh leaving us standing there with a couple of jars for tadpoles and some well wishes. No sooner than his car disappeared back onto the road did Kayla turn to me, sigh, and say, What are we doing now? I had some ideas. I wasn't as familiar with this stretch of trail than the tried and true route of the Iron Furnace, but I imagined myself as some kind of intrepid explorer and figured that, so long we stayed on the path, there wasn't anything that could go wrong. 
I also decided against heading in the direction that would have likely led me to familiar territory, based solely on the fact that I'd never been in the opposite direction and was curious what I'd find. I didn't say anything about this, of course, and just let Kayla think I knew where I was going since she didn't seem too invested in our adventure or concerned about where we ended up. So, off we went. I think it was about 15 minutes in that Kayla started to get the case of heebie-jeebies. The woods were denser on the mystery trail I decided to take, and even in the bright spring sun, everything was dark and dreary. If you looked up, it was almost like walking in twilight. You could only barely make out the blue sky if the wind caught the trees in just the right way. She nervously tapped her nails together and shuffled after me, biting her lip occasionally, saying something snarky to mask the fact that she was terrified of every creak, crunch, and crash we heard. I was oblivious. I was just excited about a chipmunk I saw. 30 minutes in, and I started to get braver, while Kayla sat on the benches pockmarking the trail. I'd leave our jars with her and merrily go skipping off the beaten path. She'd nervously watch as I disappeared into the shrubs to look for anything interesting. Bird feathers, snail shells, cool rocks, and other things that I wasn't legally allowed to take, but would stuff in my pockets anyway. With every new venture into the woods, I gained more and more confidence and would venture further and further out. If I got too far, Kayla would yell for me, insults, usually about how I was a loser, I was crazy, she hated this, and she wanted to go home. I'd usually follow the sound back to where I began, and given how far I was wandering, sometimes the sound of her voice was the only thing that guided me safely. It wasn't a perfect system, but it worked, and it worked right up until it didn't. To this day, I don't know what it was. Did Kayla stop calling because she was mad at me? Did I mosey too far out to hear her? Was something else at play? I just know that at an interesting bend in the trail, I dropped off my jars and treasures with Kayla, pressed out into the bushes, and began to walk downhill further and further into the woods in search of interesting things. Part of me knew I was going too far, but I felt this strange compulsion to keep going, like something was calling me from farther ahead. So, ahead I went, like an idiot, stumbling over rocks and getting slapped in the face with branches. When I hit the bottom of the hill, I realized I was standing at the top of a sharp drop down, a rocky jut about the height of a single-story house that was shrouded in darkness from the sheer volume of the surrounding trees. If I squinted, though, I could make out what rested at the bottom of the fall, and my eyes widened when I saw fading yellow dashes and darkened asphalt. It was a road. Not just any road, but a pretty pristine road that, aside from some cracks in the cement, was still completely drivable, but only for a stretch. I awkwardly climbed down the rocky drop to investigate, and you could only walk along it for about the length of a football field before it gave way to greenery on the other side. It was just some bizarre slice of modern age plopped right in the middle of the mountains, somehow immune to nature and time. I marveled for a bit before I finally saw the glint of something metallic in the fleeting moment of the sunlight. In a typical dumb kid fashion, my magpie brain took over and off I went to see what it was that was so shiny. Imagine my surprise when I realized that some yards away that it was a doorknob, just like the one you'd find on a door in your house. Apparently, by some fluke, I'd come out on top of the mystery door from my childhood. I hadn't even noticed it while climbing down the road, even though it'd been right next to me while I scaled slash fell down the rocks. My anxiety spiked as I stared it down. Even with my limited knowledge of direction, I knew I should not have been anywhere near this part of the park. I hadn't been on the Cumberland Gap Road since I was very young, but my gut told me that this should have been miles away from where we started, and definitely too far for a girl to walk on her own in an afternoon. I stood and stared at the door for a good long while 
before I decided that I'd had enough adventuring for the day. Despite the childhood curiosity I had about what was inside, the whole situation reeked of fish and my stomach turned at the thought of trying to open it. Inhaling deeply, I opted instead to scramble back from where I came and play Marco Polo with myself until I heard Kayla respond. If I headed directly left of the outcropping over the door and just walk straight, then I was bound to find my way back. Knock, knock, knock. My thoughts froze no sooner than I found a foothold in the stone. Three slow, steady knocks thundered on the other side of the door. My heart found its way to my throat, but my eyes couldn't find their way to the door. My brain was torn as to whether I should look or not. Tap, knock, knock, tap. There was a rhyme to it, like a song, or I'm going to feel dumb admitting this, the telegraph scene from Balto. I know it sounds absolutely stupid. As a kid, that was the only real exposure to the idea of Morse code or anything similar. In a moment of panic, I stood there, frozen, trying to see if my exposure to a 90s cartoon movie had turned me into an expert. Heck, I didn't even know if it was Morse code. The more I stood there, the more it started sounding like someone was just trying to get out of a room after they'd locked themselves in. Knock. Tap. I stumbled at the force of the knock and let out a yelp. Everything fell silent, even the birds in the trees. Frozen on the road, in the middle of the woods, I gawked at the door. Tears began to well in my eyes. This was some scary stories to tell in the dark crap, and I wasn't having it. Hello. A voice, small and familiar, warbled from the other side. Rapid tapping accompanied it, like dog claws scratching across a linoleum floor. Standing up and brushing myself off, I started trying to clamber up the rocks again. Hello. Aaron. The voice knew my name, and it hit me like a ton of bricks, that the reason it sounded familiar is that it sounded like Kayla. The cadence was all wrong though, like listening to a parrot talk. The door, or whatever was on the other side, mastered the sound, but not the method. Aaron, where did you go? You went so far, I looked for you. Foothold found, I hoisted myself up, using the tree roots and rocks and anything that would support my weight. A part of me was hurt to leave Kayla behind but I couldn't get over the weird rhythm of its speech. Besides, there was no way she could have gotten ahead of me, right? There's no way she'd even come out into the woods, right? She was scared of the actual trail, let alone the wilderness beyond it. Aaron, you left. You went so far. Aaron, where did you go? Aaron, I'm scared. It's dark. Aaron. I hit the top of the incline and pulled myself up, panting and dirty, with sore palms and mud in my mouth. Every muscle in my body trembled from a mixture of exhaustion and fear, and I lingered a bit too long, overlooking the door. It took a moment for me to realize the door had stopped talking, and it took me an even longer moment to realize the tapping had stopped. However, it took me no time at all to realize that the sound of the creaking hinges was probably a bad sign. Air in. Are you there? Air in. The voice was clearer now. When I squinted down onto the dark road, I saw the vaguest hint of a silhouette slinking out of a crack behind the door. It was humanoid, I guess, but not human. There were too many odd angles and thin extremities for it to count as human. Granted, I also didn't take too much time to try to figure out what it was, since I'd seen enough horror movies to know that she who gawks the longest dies first. I did catch a glimpse of it, whooping around to look at me, oversized eyes watching as I vanished into the woods, first quietly, and then with increasing volume as I heard it scampering after me. Screeching like a banshee, I ripped through the underbrush and screamed Kayla's name at the top of my lungs. I waited for her to yell back at me, but I only heard her voice coming from behind me, desperate and broken. Aaron, it's dark. I'm scared. Aaron, 
You went so far. I can't see you. Want to go home? Aaron. My lungs burned as I pushed myself uphill, faster and harder than any kid should ever have to go. My heart thumped against my eardrums, and my legs felt like jelly underneath me. Every time I stumbled, I imagined that thing gaining on me, and barely stopped to gauge how hurt I was before scrabbling off again. Sometimes, I made it a good ways on all fours, hunched over, trying to use my arms to pull myself ahead with my legs threatening to give out. And the whole time, the chorus of, Aaron, Aaron, chimed behind me, besides me, above me. I kept screaming out for Kayla, hoping that she'd hear my panic and answer back. In my heart, I knew I could tell the difference between her and that thing, since she'd actually sound like a human being. At least, that's what I told myself as I recklessly tore my way ahead. As I crested the hill, I found myself going downhill again, and I let gravity carry me the rest of the way. The voice behind me became more distant the faster I moved, quieter and quieter, as if it was fading from existence itself, and I thought I would too, when my feet finally went completely numb and I fell, hard, over a tree root. I felt my nose pop and the world spin as I tumbled down, finally coming to rest with a grunt on soft dirt that was strangely devoid of leaves. I opened one eye and saw the edge of a wooden bench. On the top of it was a couple of jars of snail shells and bird feathers. Standing next to it, staring at me in horror, was Kayla. She immediately fell down next to me in a fury of, are you okay? I was pretty sure God had abandoned me and I was far from okay. So I numbly stared at her until I realized I hadn't broken any bones and could probably get up. She shakily hoisted me to my feet and began to fuss over my nose. It was bloody. My clothes, they were a mess. And my hair, it was full of leaves. She pointed at fresh bruises and cuts and asked what I'd done. And I was too shell-shocked to answer, aside from some paranoid glances over my shoulder. Wow, Aaron, you went so far out and I couldn't see you anymore. It was dark. I was scared. I must have been yelling for you this whole time. How did you end up coming from uphill? Are you okay? I wanted to look for you, but what if we both got lost? I just want to go home. This is stupid. We left the jars. She led the way back. The half hour hike felt like an eternity, but not nearly as long as the amount of time we sat on the benches in the parking lot waiting for our ride to come get us. We didn't really talk. If we did, I don't remember what was said. I could easily imagine her ranting to the side of my head out of worry and anger because that's how she was and it would have been completely justified. But my mind was too fixated on the door, the thing, my pulse, how much I didn't want to sit with my back to the woods. But at the same time, I didn't want to worry Kayla by making her think there was something more wrong than I'm an idiot who fell down a hill. I just stared ahead until I saw her grandpa pull up. Of course, he wasn't happy with either of us. We should have taken the Iron Furnace Trail. I shouldn't have gone wandering into the woods. My mom was going to get him for not watching us. I ignored most of it because I had more important things to worry about, and it was a relatively quiet ride back home. But right as I got out of the car, right in front of my house, Kayla grabbed my wrist to keep me from wandering too far. Out of earshot of her grandpa, whispering like a town gossip, she asked me why I'd been messing with her while I was in the woods. I told her I hadn't. Her face went pale. Oh, she said, because it sounded like you, sort of. She was saying she had something neat to show me down the hill. She said she found a door in the mountain. I used to live in the Outbacks in Cecilia, Kentucky. There's a lot of woods around and many wild animals, which gives me a pretty good feeling every day. Well, almost every day. Before I get into it, let me give you some pointers of my property so you can better understand this situation. Where I live is rather secluded. 
The closest town is a good 30 minute drive away, making my old bus rides over an hour long in the mornings, and our neighboring houses are rather spaced out. The property is pretty nice, considering we built the house ourselves. We have a small garden, a chicken coop area, rabbit hutches, and a pig pen. My family's two dogs protected these animals, while mine stayed with the pigs since one of them was pregnant at the time. We only have about six acres of backwoods land before we reach a no hunting, private property sign with barbed wire fencing. Though it does no good, as I later found out, a tree had fallen and broken part of it. Now, although we hear coyotes all the time, we never actually see signs of them. Just raccoons, rabbits, squirrels, and possum prints, and a lot of deer tracks. Going out there during late fall, all winter, and beginning of spring, was something I genuinely enjoyed doing, though my family had restrictions as I wasn't allowed out there at nighttime. Now, while most would find it disturbing maybe, whenever an animal of ours died, I was required to take it out back and dump it near the fence to make sure no predators got too close to our property. The walk through the woods was usually fun, but I sometimes feel like I was being watched. Of course, Karma, my male German Shepherd mix, was always with me whenever I did the task. I never had him on a leash, something I deeply regret after that night. I brought him because I trust his senses more than my own. Whenever I get a sense I'm being watched, Karma would just stop walking. When I see the fur on his back rise, I'll toss the animal as far as possible and head back home. Can never be too careful, right? Now that I have explained some things, I'll get on to the point of the story. One of our prize roosters had died suddenly, and we hadn't noticed it in the chicken coop floor until it was time to put the chickens up for the night. When my older brother opened the back, we saw it. We assumed this explained why Cookie, one of my family's Pyrenees dogs, was acting odd. Even though it was around 7 p.m., and I didn't want to go into the woods since it was still early fall, which meant big spider webs still. My mother demanded that I go take it out to where it's supposed to go. I got on my boots and sweater to prevent mosquito bites and headed out to get my dog. His pen with the pigs was only a few feet away from my back steps, so it was really easy to get him if there was an emergency, like our neighbor's dogs chasing our cats. Once I opened the pen, he shot out, excited to run around as I held the Walmart bag with the dead rooster inside. Making my way to the woods, he knew where we were going and followed quickly at my side before getting in front of me. He did that often, going off and stopping to wait for me. As a 17 year old with no friends, besides internet ones, I found this to be rather sweet of him and would smile at the fact that he'd wait as if he didn't want me to be left alone. I'm on my way, I chuckled, as I saw him standing at the bottom of the small hill, just staring at me in anticipation. Once down, I kept walking, keeping an eye on him. Once I got closer to the drop-off area, I noticed that he was straying farther and farther away and wasn't stopping. So I let out a high-pitched whistle sound. Usually, he comes when I whistle, but this time, he didn't. He raised his head up, ears perked up and his attention was elsewhere. The fur on his back had raised slightly. Before I had the chance to yell no, he bolted. He was never really a barker unless a stranger was in our yard or our neighbor's dogs ran over. So it surprised me when he barked before suddenly taking off into the woods. It was then I noticed the tree had fallen when he jumped onto the tree and over the fence onto private property, chasing whatever he had seen. Karma. Karma, no, I yelled as I dropped the bag and chased after him, only stopping when I reached the fence, but he was nowhere to be seen and his barking stopped. This scared me as it was getting dark out and the day animals were falling silent, being replaced by crickets and frogs. I knew I wasn't allowed on the private property, so I stood at the fence and repeatedly called for him. Here boy, I called out, feeling frustrated. Come here, now, come back. I yelled in hopes he would return as tears began forming in my eyes. 
only for him not to return. I'm naturally a rational thinker, and assumed he had gotten too far away to hear me. So I bolted back towards home, feeling out of breath by the time I got to the small but steep hill. Mother, I called as I rushed inside. He took off and I don't know where he is. He jumped the fence back there. I told you to keep a leash on him when you're out there. She yelled as she got ready to help me find him, only to see the sun was basically down. It sets in our backyard, meaning it would be dark in the woods, since the trees would be blocking the sun. I'm sure he'll come back, she assured me, while looking out the back door. Since it was too dark out back, I decided to walk down the street and call for him. My neighbor had noticed and asked if I was looking for someone, so I told him my dog had ran off into the woods. He nodded and seemed to glance around before disappearing in his backyard. I wasn't really sure if he was going to keep an eye out or not. It had been about two hours since he ran off, and he still wasn't back. I mentally cursed myself for not having him on a leash as I went outside to feed the livestock dogs. When scooping their food, I thought I heard a high-pitched whistle. My mind was too focused on the fact that Karma was still missing to really think about it as I walked around to the backyard. When I got to Cookie, I heard the faint sound of what sounded like someone in our backyard saying, Here boy. Very quietly, like he was far away or something. I glanced over, but saw nothing besides what the moon showed. Our back porch light wasn't working currently, so it wasn't much I could see. We had just got new wood siding up in the backyard, so we had to remove the light. Deciding to ignore it, I walked over to Sarge and gave her her food when I heard it again. Only, it was louder this time. I looked over to the woods again, feeling uneasy before heading inside. I had two thoughts running through my mind, aside from karma, of course. One, there was someone in our woods, potentially a neighbor. And two, he seemed to have lost a dog, like I did. Although a stranger, I still felt the urge to help as I just lost my dog in those woods too. Mom, I said as I went inside. There's someone in the woods, I told her, ushering her to listen. She stopped doing the dishes and went out to listen as well, hearing it too. The man never called the dog's name, something I didn't notice at the time, and just proceeded to say, Here boy, come back, and come here. Now, my mom gave me a wide-eyed look, as she looked just as scared as I did when I first heard it. I think we should go help, I said as I grabbed my Winchester BB gun. The actual guns were in a locker I had no access to, so this would have to do for protection. Should we? She asked, before we heard a dog. My heart lifted as I hoped it was karma, but it was a hound dog, it sounded like, and it was getting farther away. Mother's instincts seemed to kick in as she went out there with me. We both knew the dangers of the woods at night, and she began calling out for the dog. I also called out, but I was calling out for karma, really. As we headed into the tree line, not wanting to go down too far, we noticed as we stopped just before the hill that things were way too quiet. Sure, we heard some nighttime insects, but as we heard the man call out again, he sounded closer. Even though the dog's barking was faint and clearly far away, the leaves on the ground were basically dead, yet there were no crunching noises as whoever was out there was getting closer and closer. There was no flashlight shining either. When our neighbor lost their cat, we saw their flashlights in the woods, so we became skeptical at the fact that the strange man we heard didn't have one, and we stopped calling out. Turning around, we headed back to the small path and into the safety of the yard. Our dogs wagged their tails at the sight of us, but it wasn't the same without my dog. We walked along the tree line, staying a few feet back as we looked for some form of light, but found none. It was then we heard it. Come here, boy. In a deep, angry voice. It sounded like it was down some, to our right. I felt the hair raise on the back of my neck and rushed into the back of our house as our dogs began barking like crazy, their snarled growls being the only noise as everything else went silent. 
Mother wasn't far behind as we got inside and closed the door, staring out as we turned out the lights inside. So if the man entered our yard, he couldn't see us as we stayed at the glass door. As I thought of how weird this all was, I realized something. He never said the name of what he was looking for. In fact, he said the same words I had earlier when Karma had run off. Was he copying me? My thoughts were interrupted as I heard my mother grasp and cover her mouth before she closed the curtains to the door. Her tan complexion had gone pale. Without thinking, I took a peek as I could hear one of our dogs going crazy. I saw her lunging and growling, so I looked to where she was looking. What I saw was not human. I, I don't even know what it was. Its skin was white. The moon wasn't even needed to see. It was so pale, I was sure it was a ghost at first. Its eyes sunken into its face. It didn't seem to have a nose, and it looked like it was upside down, crawling on its hands and feet, as if it was doing a crab walk, sort of. But its head was upright, back arched so its stomach was pointing up to the sky as it slowly made its way from the tree line. Its teeth didn't even fit its mouth, and its jaw hung open, a long, slimy tongue hanging out as its dark, beady eyes looked around. Here, boy. It spoke. Come here, boy. It just kept saying, its head twitching as it turned halfway, shakily, before snapping back upright. It didn't even seem to care about the dogs barking at it. Then, it looked at the house, and I swear for a second, that we made eye contact. I couldn't move for the fear it would see the curtain movements. For what seemed like an eternity, we were just staring at one another until it twisted its body slowly, bones seeming to crack and pop as it began standing on its legs. Whatever it is, was tall, tall, bony, and its skin tied around its frame, showing every bone in its disgustingly lanky body. Some hair hung from its elbows, Patches splotted around its chest. Its arms were long and almost seemed to drag on the ground. Long, sharp nails were seen. They were black, but the moonlight made them seem to shine slightly. Its body proportions were just so off. It had regular leg size, a bent torso, like its spine grew crooked, and those long arms. It stood at least eight feet tall, and I was petrified. How was it able to twist its body like that? How was a creature like this even alive? I thought I was going to crap myself at the sight of this thing. Is this what karma went after? Did this get him? My thoughts stopped when it began walking towards our house, taking slow strides, as its body seemed to sway with each small step it took. Here, boy. Its voice croaked, though it was hard to hear through the glass. My hand that held lightly to the curtain was shaking as I felt unable to look away, as I felt those eyes were staring back at me. A flash suddenly gone around our backyard. Our neighbor was heading over, I assumed, based on the direction it was coming from. He must have heard the dogs going ballistic and came to check it out. I thought he was going to get attacked, but the creature screeched and ran back into the trees. Even after it left, I was stuck just staring at the trees until the dogs turned their attention to the front yard. Did it circle around? Slowly, I finally stepped away as I looked to the door and heard a knock. My knees felt so weak as I released a breath I wasn't aware I was holding. My mom had answered the door, and it was our neighbor explaining that he had heard our dog going crazy. Just like I thought, I didn't hear much of the conversation as I felt sick and ran to the bathroom, emptying the contents of food I had just eaten hours before. Mother questioned me later that night before bed about what I saw, but I couldn't answer. She saw it too, but only a glimpse. She didn't see the way it moved, the way it stared at me. Later that night, around 2 a.m., our neighbor gave us a call, saying he saw our dog in his backyard. I ran out back, hoping it really was him. And there he was, strutting over to us with his tail between his legs as he knew he was in trouble for running off. Yet, I couldn't be mad at him. I was just glad that whatever that thing was hadn't gotten to him. I moved shortly after that experience and now live in the city. I guess I thought that by writing this out, 
the nightmares would stop. But they haven't. I can't get the image of those eyes burning into my mind out. I've also written this as a warning. If you lose your dog in the woods and hear some unfamiliar voice calling for it when you thought you were alone, run. Even if you have a group of friends or family, run. Go home and stay away from the windows. There's no telling what it might do if it actually catches you. I have lived in Inverness, Scotland all of my life. The house which I live is essentially in the middle of nowhere and is surrounded by woods which go on for ages. The trail to get onto the main road is through the woods. There is no escaping them. I have gone into these woods every day since I was a little girl. And as I got older, started taking my dog in there for long walks and sometimes even a night out in the park. Never any reports of a dangerous animal in there, except your average fox, and one time a female wolf and her pups, but they were taken to an animal sanctuary. The fact is, it's never been a dangerous place. Not until recently. I live in the same house I lived in when I was a little girl, but now it's my fiancé and I that live there. My parents moved to a petite neighborhood in the town as they're getting older and it's more manageable, and I decided to keep the house for Josh and I. Recently, I've been getting home from work later than usual, so it's been well past dark, especially this time of year. When I get back, it's usually 7.30 p.m. When I get in, my dog is always antsy for a walk in the woods, as he hasn't been getting them regularly since I've been working later and Josh is always working late. He's a police officer. Anyway, it was Monday the 25th of November when I started noticing something in the woods. I got home around 7.30, and when I got in, my dog was ready to go out for a run in the woods. He was hysterical. I quickly changed and got my dog's leash and opened the door, and he took off running out the garden gate and straight into the woods. I followed him, slower though, he knows where he's going and knows my pace and where to find me, so I take my time and leisurely stroll through the woods. And just as I was starting to get into the heart of the woods, I hear a sharp cracking sound, like something big has just stood up on a large stick and snapped it in half. I don't worry though, because I'm used to hearing these sorts of sounds, as I'm always in the woods. I carried on, and around 10 minutes after the large crack, which came from up ahead, I hear another one. This one was closer, more violent. I'm not going to lie, it made me jump. At this point, Potato, my dog, must have been a bit rattled as well, because he came skirting through the woods faster than I've seen him run before. Potato is a small dog, just a short-haired furball with stubby legs, which restricts him from running too fast. This time though, He's running too fast that he's tripping over his small legs and the woodland ground. I stop walking fast enough to reach down and grab him and I scoop him up to calm him down. Once he stopped panting so hard and his little heart stopped hammering against my arm, I put him down on the floor and we carry on our walk. Potato doesn't run off like he usually does after he comes back to make sure I'm still following. He stays by my side and doesn't stay too far behind or in front. I strike this as unusual because nothing really scares him. Like me, he is used to the sounds we encounter in the woods because he has been with me since I was 18. We walk down to the end of the woods to where there is a short river, which is usually where we stop on our nighttime walks. He gets a small drink from the river before he's ready to start back off through the woods into the house. I notice that he doesn't spend as much time messing around by the river like he usually does, and he's more on edge and jumps when he hears a crack. I figure the large crack we heard before must have scared him, so I quickly get myself sorted and walk through the woods home because I don't want him to feel on edge about being in the woods. When we reach home, I open the doors and he charges through straight into the laundry room where it's warm and he has a little bed with his favorite blanket that came with him when we bought him. I was worried, but didn't think too much of it, and I knock off my boots at the door and scrape the frozen mud off of them so I could take them into the house, 
and that's when I seen something move in my line of sight. I quickly turn and see black fur shoot behind a group of large trees. I put my boots back on and start off down the path and out of the garden gate, and I see something moving behind the trees again. I start forward, and I think it might be one of the dogs from the house just a little down the road from mine. As I went forward, Potato comes out and follows me. He walks just ahead of me before he notices movement and tenses up. He starts growling and baring his teeth, which he never does, not even when he sees a fox in the woods. The thing behind the trees starts moving forward, and when I first glance at it, I don't know what I was looking at. It looked like a big, deformed wolf, but wasn't walking like a wolf. It was walking on its hind legs, with its front legs in front of him for support. It moved like a gorilla. I was too stunned to move, and Potato was growling and snarling even worse now. When I realize it's staring at us, also bearing its large set of teeth, I notice its large, yellow, glowing eyes. The sense comes back into me, and I slowly grab Potato and run straight back into the house as quickly as I can. All the while, this thing was growling loudly at me, but didn't move. I slammed the door and took Potato into his little room and gave him some food to calm him down. I walk through the living room and close the curtains and do the same in the kitchen. Then I phone Josh and tell him what I just witnessed and he reassures me and tells me that when he gets home at 11, he will make sure everything is okay. Until then, I just sat and watched TV with Potato and had some dinner and tried to take my mind off whatever it was I seen. Just a little after 11, I see Josh's headlights shine through the curtain and Potato starts getting excited and goes and waits by the door. I stand up to look out the curtains and sure enough, Josh is shining his torch into the woods and looking about. About 15 minutes later, he comes in and says there was nothing there, but there is a deer carcass just a little into the woods. That unnerves me, but I don't think anything of it, and we go to bed, and that's that. Over the next few days, I don't think much about what I saw, and Josh doesn't mention it again either. Josh and I had been working a lot, so Potato was staying with my parents for a few days until Josh and I were off for a week for our seven year anniversary. Yesterday I finished work early and that was me off for a week. So I went to my parents' house and picked up Potato, who was quite a few pounds heavier than when I left him, all thanks to my mom. She's always had a soft spot for my dog. I spend about a half hour at my parents before going home and changing before getting Potato ready to go out for a short walk because it's getting colder and it's too cold to stay out for too long. I put on my coat, scarf, hat, and gloves, and my walking boots, and I put on Potato's winter jacket, and we set off on our walk. We get a small bit into the woods, and it's apparent that Potato hasn't forgotten about our encounter we had last time we were in there. So he doesn't run off and sticks to my side for the whole walk. Nothing happened until we were walking back to the house. We were nearing the edge of the forest, and I could see the gate to my house, and I could see that Josh was now home because his patrol car was parked next to my car. Potato sees this too, starts walking a bit faster towards the house, and Josh comes out of the front door to greet Potato. But just as Potato walked out of the forest, he gets knocked to the floor by something that's large with black fur, and the rest is a blur. I don't know what to do, but my adrenaline starts kicking in, when I realize my little potato is getting attacked by a massive beast. Josh apparently feels the same because he runs back into the house and comes back out with a rifle. I run up to the creature, which wasn't a wise choice now that I look back, and kick it with as much force as I could, and it growls and I do it again, because I see that there are red spots all over the ground, and I knew it must have been potatoes, because the beast didn't have a single scratch. I'm trying to get it off a of potato, but it's massive. He turned to look at me with its piercing yellow eyes, and I was shocked at the sight of it. It had the face of a wolf, but it was so much bigger and fiercer, and didn't have fur in some places, but was just skin. It stood up on its hind legs and towered over me. It was bigger than I anticipated. I moved back from it because I realized it was off of potato, and it followed me, and just as it was about to swipe at me, a shot rang through the air, 
and the beast-like creature howled so loud I had to cover my ears. I heard it running off, and I opened my eyes and stood in shock, but the sight of Josh running and the sound of whimpering beside me brought me back to reality and ran to Potato, who was bleeding a lot, so much that I couldn't tell where it was coming from. Josh picked him up and we ran to the house, and I followed close behind, not looking back into the woods, because I was too frightened with the idea of what I might see. I lock the door behind us, and Josh takes Potato into the laundry room, and places him on top of the clean worktop, and grabs one of his t-shirts that was folded in a pile on top of the washing machine. I stood stroking Potato's head and crying, because I didn't have a clue what I was supposed to do. Potato was whimpering and twitching, so I tried to comfort him as much as possible. Josh started wiping the mess away, and that's when I noticed something that made my heart stop. Potato had two deep gashes, one on his neck and one close to his stomach. I remember crying out, and Josh runs and grabs the phone, not before telling me to keep pressure on both of the wounds to hold it. I placed both my hands on the wounds and pressed down until Josh came back and told me that he was going to take Potato down the road to the nearest vet and told me to stay home. I wasn't happy, but I didn't argue because Potato was injured, and I could hear it in his breathing and his little eyes. Josh left and I sat crying in the living room for hours, until 3 a.m. Josh came into the house, and when I see he didn't have Potato, I cried harder. But anyway, I worry about Potato. He has to stay at the vets for a few days, as they gave him stitches, but they had to see whether he would make it through the night, as the gashes were very deep, and they weren't sure whether or not he would succumb to the wounds. Just past 11 this morning, we got a call from the vets telling us that Potato made it through the night and is awake looking for me and Josh. So we took his blanket and we sat with him for a few hours. He will be home on Wednesday if everything is okay, and I will visit him at the vets. I haven't seen anything in the woods, but we never usually did after dark and I'm not going in there hunting until I'm sure that my potato is back home safe and sound. I know yesterday wasn't the last time I will see it. I was 11 years old when a fire started spreading in the Smokies. I remember watching the news and my parents getting more worried as parks closed and rental cabins were burned to their foundations, like matchsticks in the neighboring town. I remember mom saying that the coal seam has burned for 40 years. Everyone said it would never reach the surface, that we were safe. No one seemed to know how it had reached the surface. Airtight water barriers, constant patrolling and even dynamite in riverbeds to help flood the mines, had kept the underground fire at bay all this time. And in recent years, it was almost extinguished. Sabotage was suspected, but no one could get near the mines. They and the woods around them burned with a heat and fury never before seen in our normally humid climate. We may have to take the girls and evacuate, Mom said. Nighttime in the living room felt different lately. I started to notice that the same huge white curtains behind and above the sofa that poured sunlight in during the daytime became a two-way mirror at night. With the lights on in the house and darkness outside, anyone could see through the curtains to us and what we were doing, but we couldn't see out. We only saw the curtains looming and ghostly. The scene was around 10 p.m. on the third night of the fire was familiar enough if a bit more tense. Mom and dad were watching the news and tracking the path of the fire before bed, and my seven-year-old sister Emma and I were in the living room working on a puzzle in the middle of the dark brown carpet that stretched wall to wall on that level. All the lights were on around us, but the house still seemed dim somehow. I cracked a window to let in some fresh air, now that the breeze had shifted. Emma finished the edge pieces before I could, and was gloating about it, and I was pulling all of the inside pieces away from her and laughing about it, when suddenly, a heavy gust blew the curtains in further towards us and knocked a picture of me off of the end table. Emma and I were both startled, but laughed when we realized what had happened. My mood shifted after that moment. 
I wondered about the fire, if it would reach us. The darkness outside seemed infinite now, but I'd seen the unnatural red glow on the horizon. My heart pounded afterwards longer than I felt it should have, and I couldn't stop looking over at the window. Before long, I was starting to imagine I saw a shadow and heard sounds on the other side of the immense white curtain, and the night seemed to press around the room more closely than before. I got up and turned on the dining room and kitchen lights, trying to chase away that gloom that seemed to be trying to swallow us. When I sat back down, I was able to draw my attention away from the moonless night outside, but I kept hearing something, sort of an arrhythmic tapping on the window panes. I knew I had to be imagining the sound, but if I ignored it, it grew louder, as though trying to pull my attention away from the safety of the light. Then, Emma looked up and listened. Is somebody out there? She asked, as though I might know the answer. I looked back at the curtains, which were still now. Suddenly, fear washed over me like a cold sweat, and I grabbed her hand and bolted up the stairs. Out of breath, I told our parents there was something outside. Emma stayed with mom, while dad held my hand and went down the stairs. He leaned over the couch, before I could ask him not to and yanked open the curtain. Dimly visible outside were the neighbor's houses, a road to the left, and the woods to the right. All of it was dimly lit by a few streetlights and the eerie red glow. The night air under a new moon was thick and swirling, and the woods beyond were invisible and silent, but seemed endless. I moved closer to my dad. Moths flicked against the window, leaving dull spots of dust from their wings behind on the glass. Every time they hit, I heard the tapping that had sent Emma and I running up the stairs. Louder now that I could see them. They must have been attracted to the lights in the house, Dad explained. Maybe we should turn off some of them. He turned off the dining room, kitchen, and overhead lights. I felt relieved, but the night was closing in again. Will you stay down here and watch some TV with me? I asked him. I don't feel like I'm ready to go to bed yet. Sure, for a while, Dad agreed. I curled up on the couch, uncertainly, as he sat in the only chair, but eventually felt safer with him flipping through the channels nearby. Hours later, I woke up to the sound of rain. It was dark, and I was alone. I had once been happy to sleep down here with Emma, until she started sleepwalking, that is. I usually prefer having her with me, but when I woke up to find her one night, staring at me next to my bed, empty-eyed and whispering incoherently, it seemed like she wasn't there. It felt as though some part of the inexplainable fear I sometimes felt at night had possessed her body and was sending her drifting through the quiet house like a visiting spirit. Eventually, I started locking my bedroom door at night. 3.02 was the time I saw in green digital numbers on a clock across the room when I was stirred awake by the rising sound of rain. Rain, I thought. Thank goodness. I was in complete darkness, except for a dim glow from a distant streetlight refracting through the fog. All the lights in the house were off, and Dad had gone to bed. I thought I smelled smoke again, even though the windows were shut. I looked around and all was quiet, except for the rain outside, but I had the distinct feeling of being in a situation I needed to get out of immediately. Panic was already creeping up my chest. When I looked up and saw the shadow behind the curtain above me, I blinked hard and froze. It was tall and still and had the rough shape of a human figure, but much too tall. It was right up against the window. Sleep paralysis had taught me long ago to question my senses. I slowed my breathing and closed my eyes, waiting for the waking dream to end and wishing my dad had taken me with him when he turned out the lights and went to bed. I couldn't blame him because he knew I normally loved sleeping here on the couch. My eyes had been closed no more than a second when a noise in front of the fireplace behind me sent me bolting upright. It almost sounded like a mechanical scream. Soon as I recognized the sound as Emma's toy horse, that whined when you squeezed its sides, I looked and saw the horse. 
blue with a green mane and saddle, on top of her other toys in the basket, but the room was empty. I was fully awake now, and all I could think about was how to get upstairs to my room without hurting myself in fright. I sat up more and looked back up at the window. The shadow remained. The fear that moved through me now was so swift and sickening. I couldn't move at all, even though I had flailed from the sounds behind me only seconds ago. I tried to run away or scream, but my body was going numb and I couldn't make a sound. I looked helplessly up towards my parents' bedroom. I couldn't stand to lie still anymore. I had to shake free of this nightmare somehow. I decided that the only thing left to do was weakly reach behind me and pull the cord. I yanked open the curtains with all of my remaining strength. The window stood before me, and what I saw were moths. Hundreds of them, pelting the glass in a furious swarm, causing the sound I had awoken to and had mistaken for pouring rain. Two streetlights flickered in the distance. In the middle of the swarm was a form that looked only vaguely human, but in much greater detail now. Its long hair hung black and gray in matted clumps, and its skin was the same two colors, shrunken stiffly against a hollow skull. Torn and filthy garments hung loosely around its body, exposing the hardened skin and bone. The thing looked as though it had been burnt alive and buried, and then crawled up out of the ground. The dull brown wings of the insects rolled in and out of the faint light around the black silhouette, like thick clusters of dust from an open tomb. The eyes on the figure were black and sunken in, with a dark red rim, like that distant glow on the horizon. But the pupils were somehow darker than the rest of it, and darker than night itself. I could still see them, glimmering like black sapphires, even after the streetlights flickered out. I realized suddenly that the moths were drawn to the darkness of this ghastly figure as though it were light, and were endlessly spiraling towards it, as though being pulled towards the center of a black hole. My head swarmed, and I fell dizzy off of the couch, hitting my head on the coffee table. The eyes followed. I closed my eyes, but could still see those two onyx points piercing their gaze through my eyelids. I opened them again and couldn't bring myself to look away. I could only crawl backwards into the dining room until I hit a short wall in front of the kitchen counter. The eyes followed. I tried to believe it was a dream, but even as I was sinking into unconsciousness, I knew it was not. I was brought sharply back to reality by a loud squeak of the window being opened. A charred and blackened hand crept inside through the crack it had made and tried to open the window further, but to my horror, the hand appeared to start crumbling and disintegrating in the effort. As the char and ashes fell away, bright cinders were exposed, which fell to the carpet, catching on fire. The smell that entered the room was now both smoky and acidic. It had an aged earthiness that I only smelled hints of in the most long abandoned and moldy cellars. A sweet but foul note floated on the air with it. I was backed against the wall of the counter now, and my left hand was sliding down it behind me. It was then that my hand sunk down onto two deeply sharp nails beneath the visible surface of the carpet, puncturing it so deeply that my mom would have to worry about tetanus, and the scars would never disappear. I found my voice then to scream. It was a weak, hoarse scream, but once I started, I couldn't stop. Then I saw something out of the corner of my eye. I tore my eyes away from the locked gaze of the specter to see Emma walking out of the kitchen into the dining room where I was. She was in her nightgown, holding the same toy horse that had gone off behind me earlier and was staring out into the room at nothing with an impossibly dilated eyes that appeared black and uncomprehending. I was once afraid of her and for her. Emma, I managed to say. Shh, she replied, approaching me. She put an icy hand on my shoulder. Stay here, she whispered. Emma walked towards the figure outside, whose gaze had now shifted up towards my mother's window. She picked up a small blanket and dropped it on the small patch of cinders and small fires that had formed on the carpet. Then Emma put her hand on the window 
and began speaking through the glass in sounds and syllables that I still have never been able to identify as an actual language. Emma gently touched the glass. The figure outside began to slowly disappear, as though it were disappearing into the night. It fell apart like it was made of only ashes and had been hit by a strong wind. Its gaze still fixed towards the room where my parents slept. The moths disappeared as well, a few falling dead on the windowsill. As the apparition faded, so did my consciousness, away into nothing. When I awoke again, it was morning, and I was in my own bed upstairs. I heard my parents talking excitedly about the news, that the fire was receding, despite all predictions to the contrary, and we wouldn't have to evacuate. I didn't need to feel the pain in my palm of my hand to know I had not dreamt what had happened, but I was startled nonetheless when I looked down at it. What I saw there were two black puncture wounds, red rimmed and staring at me like two black eyes. Mom wanted to know why there were so many dead moths downstairs and where all the dirt and ashes in the windowsill came from and what happened to the carpet. I don't remember what I said, but it wasn't the truth. Emma remembers none of it, except stories of the damage all around us, and also a dream that Tina, her toy horse, was calling out to her on that awful night. I heard that horse go off in the early morning hours a few times after that, and Emma's shuffling footsteps not long after. All I could do was pull the covers over my head, shiver, and try to sleep. I could really use some help here, as I'm starting to get really worried. Last night, I was followed by a very creepy lady while out hiking in my local trails at state land. I've hiked and hunted these trails my whole life, and not once have I encountered anything quite like this. Don't get me wrong, I've had my fair share of spooky things happen while out solo camping, but this, this chilled me right to the bone and now I think I'm being stalked. Let me explain what's going on, and hopefully, one of you may be able to help me out here. Christmas Eve, I had nothing to do, as I have no wife, no kids, and my parents live three hours away. So to get rid of my boredom, I had this genius idea of going on a solo hike through our local trails. Like I said, I've hiked these trails multiple times. This time, however, I'll never forget. I got out to the trailhead about 5 p.m. I had my headlamp on, and I knew these trails like the back of my hand, so I wasn't too concerned with the sunlight quickly fading. I don't know if any of you are from Michigan, but we are having a surprisingly sunny and warm December. However, it still gets dark around 5 to 5.30. The weather was beautiful and perfect for a nighttime walk. We don't have too many nice winter days like this, so I wanted to take full advantage and enjoy the warm night air. So I got out of my truck and started up the trailhead. This particular trail I was on started out in dense pine trees and after a mile or so opened up to these awesome valleys and huge fields. Most of the time, if I was quiet enough and looked around, I could see some deer grazing and other wildlife. This time though, nothing. I was honestly quite surprised there wasn't a single animal, considering how beautiful of a night it was. Now that I think about it, I didn't see or hear even a squirrel in those pines, which is very uncommon. They are plentiful in these parts, and no matter the time, I can always hear them running and playing in the trees. This time, it was completely silent. I kept on walking though, and just enjoyed the peace and quiet. Once I exited the pines and entered the first field, I started to get this nagging feeling in the pit of my stomach, like something was watching me. I chalked it up to me being paranoid due to the lack of wildlife and continued on. I wish I would have turned back right then and there, but if I did, well, I wouldn't be posting here now would I? Anyway, I continued on, and the feeling just intensified as I progressed. At this point, I was a good mile and a half in, and it dawned on me, if there was something out here with me, I was screwed. Not a single person knew that I was out here, and I never had cell reception when I was in the area. 
If a predator was stalking me, I would just be done for. I was kicking myself for not bringing my handgun with me, honestly. We don't have a whole lot of dangerous game here in central Michigan, so I didn't think twice about it when leaving. I was nearing the end of the first field, and before I stepped into the next little section of pines, I decided to take a quick look around, just to satisfy that nagging feeling in the back of my mind. At first, I didn't see anything, but just as I was about to turn back around, something caught my eyes. There was a slight movement back about a hundred yards behind me. What? I whispered as I squinted to get a better look. I wasn't sure, but it looked like a figure, half hidden behind a bush. I stared closely, and when I saw it shift slightly, my heart leapt into my throat. The figure was definitely humanoid, and it appeared to be staring straight at me. Hello? I foolishly called out, hoping whoever it was would simply identify itself. As soon as I hollered, the figure quickly ducked behind the bush, disappearing from my view. My heart was racing pretty good at this point, a million worst case scenarios running through my mind. I couldn't help but think it was a serial killer ready to pounce and stab me, stashing my body in these woods. I turned around, started walking a little faster, trying to distance myself from whoever was out here with me. To my horror, I heard twigs and sticks snapping a little ways behind me as the person started following me. I have a gun, I shouted, trying to scare them into leaving me alone. Looked over my shoulder to see where they were at, and when I did, my heart hammered in my chest. I swear I thought I was going to pass out. The person was now maybe 20 feet behind me, and I could tell it was a woman. Only, her jaw hung open, as if in complete shock, her eyes extremely wide, staring directly at me. When I first turned around, she was still walking, and the way she moved scared me so bad it sent me into a sprint upon looking at her. I know it sounds kind of funny, but believe me, it wasn't. She was tiptoeing as quiet as she could, in the same way a cartoon character would, trying to be sneaky her legs taking these huge, lanky steps. Everything about the way she looked and moved just sent me these shivers down my spine. Leave me alone, lady, I shouted as I ran as fast as I could. As I ran, I heard her start to laugh hysterically as she chased me. She was no longer trying to be quiet, as I could hear her crashing through the woods. Catching up to me rather quickly, I decided to turn and run off the trail once I rounded a bend where I knew she couldn't see me for a moment. As soon as I stepped off, I quickly hid behind a tree and turned off my headlamp. After a couple seconds, I heard the sound of her heavy, odd footsteps as she got closer and closer. I held my breath and slammed my eyes shut, sending a quick prayer to let her pass. Her horrible laughter echoed through the woods as, thankfully, she ran past me. As soon as her footsteps sounded a little further down the trail, I jumped out from behind the tree and took off running back the way I came. I hadn't got 20 feet when I heard a curdling scream bellow through the woods. I ran faster than I ever had in my life, running on pure adrenaline and the will to live. I just knew if she caught me, I wouldn't make it. The sound of her footsteps once again got louder and louder as she got closer. How could she run so fast? I felt a huge wave of relief as I saw the entrance of the trailhead, maybe a hundred feet. Somehow, I ran even faster as I knew my truck would be right there. I reached into my pockets and fished for my keys. She let out another hideous scream as she got even closer, maybe fifty feet behind me now. I got into my truck and jumped in, putting the keys in the ignition and starting it in record time. I backed up and peeled out of there as fast as I could without losing control. After one final scream of frustration, I looked in my rearview mirror to watch the woods disappear in my rearview mirror. The whole drive home, I kept checking behind me, afraid I'd see her chasing after me, even though I knew it would be impossible at 60 miles an hour. Five minutes later, I pulled into my driveway and jumped out of my truck once parked, running full blast inside. I slammed the door behind me and locked it. I ran around my house, locking every window and door, not feeling safer until I knew I was locked up and safe. 
I walked upstairs to my bedroom and laid in my bed, catching my breath. After a while, I must have passed out from exhaustion. I woke up to the pitch black room and quiet house. My heart started racing as I remember the lady from the woods, and I jumped up to look out my window. No, I quietly whispered as I looked to my backyard. The lady from the woods was standing in my backyard, slack-jawed and staring right at me. My heart once again pounded so hard I thought I would faint. As soon as she noticed me, she smiled this huge, impossibly wide, ear-to-ear -ear grin. She then shrieked that awful scream again and ran back into the woods. Needless to say, I didn't sleep after that. So I'll start this off by saying, I love camping. It's my hobby that I do every weekend to clear my mind. But the thing is that I'm not your usual camper. Like, I don't go to spots that everyone knows about. I go to the deepest, most secluded parts of the forest that most people consider not reachable. And I'm usually going alone. This time was not very different than most of my camping trips. I hopped in my old Ford Ranger, which usually had some trouble starting up, traveled a couple of hours into the pine forest until I reached a very suspicious looking dirt road. The thing is, I like suspicious looking dirt roads. They usually take me to the best camping spots. I got onto it. It was very unkept, looked like a car hadn't driven on it in the last year, but my old truck didn't have any trouble driving on it. I drove for what seemed like an hour until the road ended on a small clearing. I parked my truck and got out and looked around. I realized I'm in the middle of nowhere, which, oddly enough, was a good thing for me. I got all my gear with me and started walking towards the woods. When I reached the tree line, an odd feeling of uneasiness descended upon me. Like when you're alone in the house and all of a sudden the power to the whole neighborhood cuts off and you feel like something is about to come and rip you to pieces. Or is it just me? Anyway, I thought a little, but ignored it as the unusual forest creepiness. I started walking deep into the forest, and when I say deep, I mean deep. Like walking a couple of hours through fallen trees, big rocks, hills and everything related. Finally, I found a small stream, and by small, I mean like nine feet wide and five feet deep at most. It had a small clearing on the edge, and I decided that this was my home for the next three days. I set up my tent and got a small fire going. By this time, it was 4.30 p.m. and the sun was starting to set, but it was quite dark since the trees covered most of the sunlight anyway. I decided it was the perfect time to sit down, crack a beer, that I left to cool in the river, and relax. By 8 p.m., I was starting to get very sleepy. I gathered all of my stuff, collected all of the trash and leftovers, put them in the bag and hung them on some tree to keep the bears away from my camp. I got in my tent and quickly fell asleep. I had a dream that night. I was at the tree line where I parked my car. I felt that feeling of uneasiness again, but this time it was different. It was stronger. As I was about to start walking into the forest, I heard a strange noise, like a stick breaking from a heavy weight, but hollower. I turned to the source of the sound to see a tall, skinny shadow standing a hundred feet away on the other side of the clearing, just at the tree line behind some bushes, which it was towering by at least 12 feet. Of course, I got scared, turned around and tried to run, but you know how dreams are. My feet just couldn't get any grip on the ground, like some invisible force was holding me back. I turned around to see the shadow was now slowly walking towards me and making a crack with every step. When I saw that, sheer terror descended upon me. I closed my eyes and when I opened them, I was in my tent again, sitting and breathing heavily. Weird, I thought, as I didn't remember waking up. My rationality got the better of me. After all, it was just a dream, right? People sometimes don't remember waking up from terrible dreams. 
Anyway, it was around 9am, and I proceeded with my daily duties, which consisted of looking around the camp for any trails from wild animals, gather some wood for the night, and checking the trash bag that I hung from the tree. I started by collecting some wood from the surrounding forest, then check for any trails, and didn't find any, until I headed for the trash bag. When I got to the tree, it should have been hanging from nothing. And by that I mean absolutely nothing. No bag. No trash. My first thought was bears, but no. As far as I'm aware, bears don't eat cans inside of plastic bags, right? I looked around for signs from any wildlife, but nothing, except some weird small holes in the ground. They looked like someone took a big sharp stick and stabbed it into the ground. The weirder thing is, they were spaced out like footsteps. My first thought was, maybe another camper, but that didn't seem rational. Like who would come this far into the forest, in the middle of the night, just to steal my trash bag? Anyway, I just followed the footsteps. They circled a couple times around my camp, which was creepy enough, but then they headed straight into the river. These footsteps, if you could call them that, didn't resemble the trails of any animal that I know of. I got creeped out, and I didn't want to follow them any further. Some time passed. It was now 2pm, and I decided that a short swim in the cold stream wasn't a bad idea. I smelled like sweat anyway. I got my bathing suit on and headed straight toward the river. I jumped in the cold water and immediately felt refreshed and cleansed. I swam around and jumped in the water for a little. Then it hit me. The footsteps. Maybe I should go back and try to follow them again. I got to where they entered the river, checked around for where they should have exited the water, and after about 15 minutes of searching in the cold water, I started to feel quite cold, and right as I was about to head back from my camp, I saw them. There they were, the same weird holes in the ground on the other side of the riverbed. I got out of the river and started following them again. About 50 feet in, I notice that the footsteps suddenly come to a complete stop. I look around to find more, but no luck. It's like the person, or I should say, thing, that left them, suddenly disappeared into thin air. I got creeped out, and decided to leave whatever left those weird holes alone. I got back to my camp, dried myself off, ate some canned beans, got a decent fire going, and drank some beer while relaxing around a campfire. By this time, it was around 5pm, and the sun had already set, covered by the thick pine forest. Time for relaxation, I thought. Two hours in, and I started feeling sleepy again, until I heard it. The hollow noise of a stick being broken that I heard in my dream last night. Shivers ran down my spine, and a sudden feeling of dread filled my whole body. A bear? I thought. But no. There was no trash bag that could attract him this time, and the sound was coming from the total opposite way, from where those footsteps ended. And then, crack, like someone was walking in a big hallway with cheaply made wooden heels that broke with every step. I turned around, and there it was, on the other side of the riverbed, that skinny and tall shadow illuminated by only the moonlight. It was just standing there, observing me. I just stared at it with horror as my mind was racing with thoughts of what it would do. Then it hit me. I always carry a gun on my camping trips. I jumped out of my resting spot, running straight from my tent to get my Winchester bolt-action rifle. As I reached the tent, I unzipped it, opened the little door, and the second I entered, everything got black for a part of a second. It was like when you suddenly stand up and your peripheral vision goes dark. And there I was, laying next to the campfire, which had already stopped burning. I noticed it was starting to get bright outside. I checked my clock and... 7 a.m.? How is that possible? I was just in front of the tent. Did I fall asleep and not notice? Was I that sleepy last night? I had so many thoughts running through my head at that moment. A couple of minutes passed, 
and I shook it off as another dream. Weird, but very realistic and scary dream. But still just a dream, right? I started going for my daily duties, just like the previous day. I checked wildlife trails, gathered wood, checked the trash bag, and then... What? The trash bag. I didn't leave the trash bag last night, didn't I? But there it was, hanging from the same tree. Was I going crazy, losing my mind, or is there someone that's playing tricks on me? I stood there for a second and thought about it. A sudden blast of courage got over me. I got my gun from my tent, loaded it, and headed to where I saw the creature last night. I crossed the river, looked around for the footsteps. It wasn't hard to find them. They were right where I last saw the creature last night. I followed them, pointing my gun at every sound I heard, walking around ten minutes until I came across another clearing in the middle of the forest. I looked around for more footsteps, but there weren't any, and then it hit me. The last two footsteps were a bit deeper than the previous ones. That means, the creature didn't vanish, it jumped. I immediately looked up in the trees above me. Nothing. I looked around the clearing. Still nothing. Then I checked to the top of the trees, and there it was. On the other side of the clearing, right in front of me, some 250 feet away. It was standing there, at the very top of one of the pine trees, staring at me, observing. I pointed my gun at the side of it, then squeezed the trigger, and right as my gun fired, the thing, it just jumped off the top of the tree, before the bullet could even hit it. Then another tree, and another, still making that stupid cracking sound with every jump. It was getting closer to me, and then, I just ran, straight to my camp. When I was in front of my tent, I couldn't hear the cracking anymore, but still, pure fear was all over me. I grabbed the most important things from my camp, like my phone, wallet, and some more ammo for the gun, in case I needed it later. I then ran straight for my car, but deep inside me, I knew that my car was at least a three hour walk from my camp, but that didn't stop me. I ran as fast as I could, and as far as I could. Of course, my body couldn't keep up with all of that running, but my mind was stronger. When I couldn't run, I sped walked. I just, I couldn't stop moving. I was so scared, even when I hadn't heard a sound in over an hour, which was kind of eerie on its own, but I didn't care. I just had to move as fast as I could. About three-fourths of the whole distance, I just couldn't run or even walk for that matter. I needed to rest, even if my mind didn't want to. My body couldn't keep up with it. I stopped behind a fallen tree and sat down for a second. I was sitting there for no more than three minutes. Then I heard it, that cracking sound. I was filled with terror and immediately started running again, even if my body wasn't ready for it. Finally, after what felt like days of running, I saw the clearing where my car was parked in the distance. I felt relieved, but not for long. As I got closer to the car, I heard the cracking sound again. This time it was very close. I really thought this was the end for me. That thing, whatever it was, was about to get me. And just as I accepted my fate, I slammed into my car's door. I was so buried in thoughts that I didn't even realize I was right in front of my car. Immediately, I unlocked my car and entered it. I tried to breathe for a second, but immediately got shoved back to reality. That thing was still cracking its way towards me. I put my keys into the ignition, then turned them, and nothing, not even a click. Battery. It used to disconnect very easily on bumpy roads, but that meant I had to get back out there, open the hood, and connect the battery. After a minute, I had barely gathered the courage, but I pulled the knob, got out, and opened the door, fidgeted around with the battery, and finally got it connected. I ran straight back to the car, locked all of the doors, and tried to start it again. I turned the key. This time, the starter rotated, but the car didn't start. I tried it again, and still the same. 
Just when I was about to lose all hope, I turned the key a third time, and bam, the old truck started right up. I peeled out of there all the hours back to my house, while still hearing those cracking noises echoing through my mind, never to be forgotten. Since then, I hadn't gotten that far into the woods, and certainly don't go camping alone. Was that thing trying to make me go mad by moving the trash bag, appearing right in front of me and making it seem like I dreamt it, so it can take me easily? Those are the questions that will probably never get an answer. No one believes me. I don't even know if I believe myself anymore. Maybe I'm just really going crazy. If you have any idea what this thing was, please inform me. And remember, never go too far out into the woods, especially alone. I think every town has urban legends that float around. Although, even as a kid, I never believed them. I always saw them as just silly stories that locals had made up to scare the children. The stories of the creatures at Needlepoint Creek seemed ludicrous to me. I learned later on that I was horribly mistaken. Needlepoint Creek is located deep in the woods of Indiana. In fact, it wasn't too far from my childhood home. I lived on the edge of town, right about where the woods began. My friends and I would always play in the woods, building forts and climbing trees. We would never go far enough to reach the creek though. My mother was never the overprotective type, but she forbid that I go deep into the woods with my friends. It's not safe, she said. I remember always asking why, but she would never tell me. My father once told me the stories about Needlepoint Creek. Creatures dark as night, with claws sharp as knives, wreak havoc upon lost souls near Needlepoint Creek. Don't ever go there, you understand? He would always tell me. I never believed him. I thought he was only trying to reinforce Mom's rule. As we got older, my friends and I got more and more curious about what the deep woods actually contained. It was the summer of senior year. I was sitting in my room with my friends when Ricky brought up the idea that we travel deep into the woods and camp for one night near the creek. Are you crazy? Ben asked. Our parents warned us never to go there. You just want to have a sleep over there? Like it's no big deal? Oh come on Ben, I blurted out. This could be our last summer here. Don't you want to find out if the rumors are true? Besides, maybe you'll finally find a girlfriend there, I teased. Haha, <laughs> you're so funny, he shot back. Fine, but for one night only, and you have to do my homework for a week. Deal. I smirked and shook his hand. June 15th, around 3 p.m., we set off into the woods, armed only with camping gear and determination. At about two miles in, the trail ended abruptly into thick brush and woodland. Looks like we're going to have to rough it from here, Ricky said. Let's do this, I said, determined. It was hard to maneuver over the uneven ground covered with decaying leaves and tree roots. We reached a river that had been dried out long ago, leaving a deep hole in its path that extended for miles. I spotted a fallen tree that fit perfectly over the edge. Not to worry, boys. I think I just found our way across. Ricky made it across just fine. Come on, guys. It's not so bad. Ben began to panic. No guys, I don't have good balance. I don't think I should. Listen man, the log is wide enough. If you're careful, you won't even have to worry. You can do this, okay? I reassured him. Okay, he hesitated. He began to cross nervously. He reached about halfway, and then I watched in horror as his body shifted in a way that looked like he was being pushed by an invisible force. He lost his footing and fell into the ravine. His body hit the rocky ground below with a sharp thud. I screamed, Ben, are you okay? I found a way to lower myself to the bottom. When I reached him, his body was curled into a ball and he was holding his leg and crying. I just broke my leg, he choked. Ricky muttered, we have to go back. How do you suppose we do that? I questioned. 
Ben can't exactly walk at the moment, and we can't just leave him here. Okay, maybe we could carry him. You know, like on our backs or something, Ricky said, panicked. Okay, but how would we even get him out of this ravine? I have a rope in my bag, Ben groaned. You could tie it around my waist and pull me out that way. The process of getting Ben out of there was excruciating. Ricky and I tied a makeshift harness around his body. Ricky climbed up the rock wall and began pulling up the rope. I stayed behind to guide him. I told you we shouldn't have done this. Ben cried out in pain as his limb hit the rock wall. I'm sorry, Ben. I promise, but we're going to get you out of this. I felt awful. Once we got Ben to the surface, Ricky and I threw each of his arms over our shoulders. With the inevitable darkness of night looming over us, we began heading to the direction we came from. Ben yelped in pain with every step. We walked about a mile and then came across a stretch of bushes. I'll go see what's on the other side before we drag Ben through there, Ricky said. He disappeared into the bushes for a moment. It went silent. Ricky? I called out. No response. Come on, man, this isn't fun. You guys aren't going to believe this, he said as he appeared from the bushes. What are you talking about? We must have circled back around or something, he said. What do you mean? I asked, alarmed. I don't know. We're back at the ravine. That's impossible. We went straight through, I almost shouted. If you don't believe me, you can take a look for yourself. I pushed through the bushes, and sure enough, we were back at the ravine. Suddenly, everything was quiet. Hey guys, are you back there? No response. Guys. Suddenly, I heard giggling, but there was something off about it. It almost didn't sound human. Ben, Ricky, is that you? The laughing turned to a low growl. I ran back through the other side. Why do you look so scared? Ben asked. Yeah, why do you look so scared, Isaac? Ricky smirked. I don't know. I guess there's an animal back there or something. I think you're just imagining things. I didn't hear anything, Ricky said as he stared past me. We headed through the brush, yet again, trying to find our way out. About a half a mile later, we came into the same patch of bushes. Okay, I know for sure we didn't circle around. This isn't possible, Ben yelled. I don't know what's happening. I began to panic. Ricky said something. Stay here. I'm going to find a way out of here, I told them. I ran through the woodland, trying not to trip. I found myself back in front of the bushes. What? I shouted. I ran in a different direction. Back at the bushes, I ran again and again and found myself in those same bushes each time. Guys, I think we're somehow stuck in a loop. I tried to catch my breath. That's not possible, Ben said in disbelief. I don't know, okay? All I know is I tried every direction, and every direction led me back here. I don't know what's going on, but for right now, there's no way out. I tried to come to terms with it as the words left my mouth. What are we going to do? He cried. I don't know, but for right now, our best bet is to try to stay calm and set up camp while we figure this out. Ricky and I set up the tent that we brought with us. I built a fire, then tried my best to stabilize Ben's wound with a first aid kit that I had taken from my parents' closet. Hey Isaac, Ben said as I was wrapping his legs in gauze. Yeah? What if our parents were right? He said. What do you mean? I asked. About the creatures. What if that's what's happening right now? That's not possible. Those are just silly kid stories. I tried to reassure him. But I had a feeling in the pit of my gut that I was wrong. Night fell over us in a blanket of darkness. We all sat around a fire to keep warm. Ricky stared off into the darkness. We should just accept it he said in a trance-like state. Um, except what? I said, concerned. We're never getting out of here. They're coming for us. They're going to take us, and we should accept it. Who's they? I asked, frightened. Them, he replied as he pointed into the darkness. 
You know something, Isaac? He continued, reaching into his bag. What are you talking about? I said, on edge. The creatures really aren't that bad, in fact. He said calmly, as he began to pull a fishing knife out of his bag. Ricky, what are you doing with that? I panicked. I think we should embrace them. He laughed and I watched in shock as he lurched forward and got Ben in the stomach. I heard Ben scream. No, I screamed. The next few seconds passed by in slow motion. I ran toward him and tried to tackle him. With almost inhuman strength, Ricky threw me into a tree. I felt my skull hit the base of the tree and everything went black. I woke up slumped against the tree. My eyes fluttered open as I saw Ricky crying next to Ben's body. What have I done? He sobbed. They made me do this, he screamed. Who made you do what? I choked. The creatures. I never wanted to hurt anyone, but they made me. His face was smeared with blood. I tried to sit up. It's okay. We can fix this. I tried to calm him. No, we can't. Ben is gone. They made me kill him. And now, he stood up. They're going to make me get you, too. He cried as he headed towards me. Ricky, we can talk through this. I'm your friend, I pleaded. I'm sorry, Isaac. He sobbed as he raised the blade above me. In a split second, I saw a large, black, mist-like creature swoop over Ricky. With claws sharp as knives, the creature tore at Ricky. The creature took one final swoop. I began screaming, and he was gone. I vomited and began sobbing. I heard the creature let out a shrill screech as it disappeared into the darkness of the night. Take me too, I cried, not wanting to live with what I just witnessed. Eventually, I decided to try to walk back home. The way back was difficult because of my concussion, but I was no longer stuck in a loop. I reached my house. My mother screamed when she saw that I was covered in blood. She cried as she held me. You went into the woods, didn't you? I just stared at the wall, in shock, trying to process everything. No one except for my mother believes me about the horrors of that day. I write this from prison. I'm being held on two counts of first degree murder. I don't know why the creature decided to let me live. It would have been kinder to take me too. I guess I'll never know. I'm an innocent man. You, dear reader, may not believe me, or maybe you do, whatever you choose to believe. I ask that you please beware the creatures of Needlepoint Creek. When I was a young kid, around the age of my earliest memories, so probably four or five, I had trouble sleeping. I don't have a great memory about most things. But I remember my sleep troubles, probably better than anything else I do from that age. I was an only child, I'm adopted, and I lived in a small, older home with my parents. Living room, tiny kitchen, two small bedrooms, and one bathroom to share. Not exactly a mansion, but one of the upsides for a little kid of not being well off is that it meant my parents were never more than 10 feet away in our tiny little house. One of my first memories is running into my parents' room and telling them about the faces I saw while I was laying in bed. I still remember cuddling up with my favorite stuffed animal, a Care Bear of all things, for what felt like hours every night trying and failing to go to sleep. I would just stare up at the ceiling, and while I did, it was like a parade of faces would slide in and out of my vision. The faces were a mix of contorted but normal people, and the typical scary things a kid might see in movies. Vampires, werewolves, creepy old women. They would just start at the top of my field of vision and go sliding to the bottom, sort of like a weird 3D movie without the funny glasses. Obviously, this was terrifying to a little kid, most of the time, I would hide under the blankets and hope to eventually fall asleep. But some nights were harder than the rest. The night I went running into their room, clutching my Care Bear, the first time I really fought the fear, I tried to desperately explain to them what was happening. 
Of course, they told me I was having a bad dream, and that I would be fine, and they tucked me back in my bed, and my mom sat with me for a little while. I slept with the TV static on that night, and before long, that was the only way I could go to bed at night. But even as a little kid, I knew I wasn't dreaming, I hadn't been asleep, and I hadn't woken up. It was happening to me while I was awake, and it continued. Sometimes better, or sometimes worse, for months, or even years. I'm 31 now, with a family of my own. Looking back, I know I was going through night terrors, and probably sleep paralysis. I'm a very critical, science-driven person, and I'm not particularly religious. I don't think it was anything more than that, and I know my parents did the best they could. They probably have never even heard of the term night terrors or sleep paralysis. It got somewhat better with time, but I will never be able to forget how it felt. It feels, I should say. I've struggled with them on and off in my adult life, and unfortunately, it's become more and more common over the last few years. It's really hard to explain the differences between a night terror and a normal nightmare if you haven't experienced it. But you know how nightmares can be scary, and then you wake up and need a few seconds to settle yourself? I've had plenty of nightmares. Frankly, they don't bother me that much, and I feel fine as soon as I wake up from them. But night terrors are completely different. I would wake up screaming, but not at anything in particular. My body was completely pumped full of adrenaline, the fight-or-flight mode engaged, in the only way that it could be when your body knows you're facing imminent danger. But the worst part is what it does to your mind. There's no rational thought for a solid minute or two upon waking up. I wish I was better with the words to describe it, but it's pure terror. I can't reason myself out of it. I can't take deep breaths to calm down. I can't do anything but grasp and try to slowly stop the screaming or the whimpering it turns into after a few seconds. My muscles on fire like I've just finished a marathon. Anyway, I would suggest never having night terrors. For better or worse, I've gotten as used to it as possible. Like I said, I struggled with it a lot as a kid, but it's becoming much more rare as an adult until the last few years, when it's become a little more frequent. I would only have one or two episodes a year. I'm sorry if I'm giving too many details, but I feel like it's important context to understand the reason why I'm posting this here. I don't remember exactly when it started, but my trouble when I was a kid didn't stop when I would finally fall asleep. I don't usually remember my dreams or even my nightmares after a few minutes. But there's one or two dreams I'll never forget, much as I wish I could or try to convince myself I have. Because I had the same nightmare almost every single night for months. It always began the exact same way. I'd be sitting on the back porch of our little house. Like I said, the house was tiny, one of many small, some run down, houses in the neighborhood. Our back door had three wood steps leading down into the yard. Turned to the left, and a few feet away was the side of a house where my parents kept the trash cans, and where you could turn and walk back toward the front gate. To the right from the door was the driveway that came into the backyard and the outside garage. And if you looked straight out from the porch, there was maybe 10 feet of backyard, then a chain link fence with a gate that ran from my neighbor's wooden fence on one side to the edge of the garage on the other, gating off the rest of the yard that went 50 feet or so back. This is where I would begin my dream, the only dream that ever mattered, every single time. I'd be on the back porch, and it was 12.03, dark but with enough pale light to see the gray shape of my yard around me, almost like the light of the moon I never saw. I'll never know how I knew, or if it took many iterations of the dream for me to learn. But what I remember now is that I knew that at 12.07, they would come for me. As a kid, I always thought of them as werewolves, but I know that I never actually saw them, nor do I even remember them having a defined form from what I can recall. 
They would come from the left side of the house, and they would grab me. It felt like my entire body would be grabbed at once, and I would wake up screaming, sweating, and crying for my mom. Normal night terror stuff, right? I always tried to rationalize it that way, at least. But like I said, this wasn't like any other nightmare, because every few nights, the dream would begin again. The back porch, 1203. Screen door locked behind me. The trash cans to the side of the house. The driveway where during the day, I'd shoot hockey pucks at the garage door. And the red curtain. It's the red curtain that made all the difference in the world. Remember I said there was a fence that blocked off half of the backyard? In the dream, that fence was gone. In its place was a bright red curtain. The kind you'd find on stage or at a movie theater. The world around me shined silvery in a pale light of the moon. I now realize I never looked up to find. But the curtain was bright red. It had a slight part at the top. A few feet to my left if I was looking out from the porch. Through the few feet of open space at the top, but not at the bottom, I could see what looked like daylight. And the branches of the tree we had, behind where the fence slash curtain stood. Staring at dark, scary images was my nightly ritual, followed by waking up on the back porch. That sliver of daylight felt familiar. It felt like home. I desperately wanted to reach it, but I never could, because when I walked to that curtain to try to find the seam that went to that part at the top, it didn't exist. Or maybe it did, and I just never found it. Instead, I would pull on the curtain and try to open it at the split. It would just keep billowing out. I'd pull and pull, and there was always more red curtain. It would eventually envelop me. In a panic, trying to reach that sliver of daylight that felt like home. I would always fail, and then they would be there. Grabbing me and sending me back to my bed, screaming, clutching my bear. Reoccurring dreams are a known phenomenon, and if every night I woke up fighting the curtain, I could rationalize this a lot better as an adult, but I didn't have the same dream every night. I mean, I did. The porch, the light, the curtain, but it never felt the same, because every night when I'd go back, that sliver of light at the top of the curtain would just be a little narrower, a little more unreachable, and eventually, I knew where I was. I don't know that I ever recognized I was in a dream. After all, I could have chosen to fly or whatever, had I been truly lucid. But I always knew I was back in the same place, at the same time, and I knew what would happen to me. I tried a hundred different ways to go through the red curtain. I tried climbing it. I tried going at it from the other side. I tried going around only to find myself thoroughly blocked by a wall of a fence on my left and the garage on my right. And every time I failed, that sliver of hope at the top would grow smaller, inch by inch. I couldn't tell you how long this lasted. For all I know, it was a couple of months or a few dozen times, becoming aware of myself on the porch at 12.03. Or it could have been years. The dreams were more spaced out, like I said. I don't have a great memory of when I was that young, but I remember when the dreams finally stopped. I don't remember how many times I tried that curtain, but I know it wasn't every time I entered that dream. Other times I would try to escape in a different direction, or even out the side where they came from. Nothing ever worked, and they all ended up the same way, with the sensation of being squeezed from all around and waking up in my bed in terror. I wish I had some heroic story of how I made it end, of how I stood up to the fear and declared it had no power of me. That's what always worked in the movies, but that's not what happened. Instead, I hid. Of course, I had tried before, by cowering under the boards of the porch, where by day I would dig up worms, and by night I would hunker down, wishing I could live under the dirt the way they did. But hiding there never worked. 12.07 would come. I'd hear footsteps coming from the side of the house. And a few seconds later, it would be over. It ended the night I threw myself into the trash can. I don't know if it was a coincidence. 
me finding something to overcome the mental hurdle, or something else. But I threw myself into the metal trash can, and covered myself with all of the boxes inside. I remember staring up at the now tiny, sliver of light at the top of the curtain, as I pulled the lid over my head, and I remember the footsteps passing me by for the first time ever. I never had that dream again after that night, not once in my life. Most of the time I can pretend it never happened, and avoid the chill I have now from recalling all of it again. But as I said, earlier tonight, it all came rushing back. I had a normal night with my family, and I tucked my son to sleep at 7.30, as usual. Unfortunately, night terrors seem to have a genetic component to them, and my son may have inherited something I never wanted to give to him. He's almost four now, and has had a hard time sleeping his entire life. He wakes up at night in a sweat, screaming. When he was younger, he could never articulate what it was that scared him, and we chalked it up to nightmares, or possibly even night terrors. When my son was old enough to talk, he would say he doesn't like to sleep because it's scary, which is what he always says to try to get out of doing something he doesn't want to do. Anyway, we brought this up to the doctor, who said there aren't really any answers to what causes night terrors, nor are there really any treatments. So when my son woke up crying tonight, a few hours after going to sleep, as he does on way too many nights, I went in to soothe him back to sleep, feeling guilty as always, that it's probably due to me in some way he inherited this, but tonight was different. As I set him down, he said something that chilled me to the bone and brought back a wave of memories I wish I didn't have. Dad, I'm scared of the red curtain. Sometimes, when I've had a really rough day and I'm having troubles relaxing, I go for a drive to clear my mind. There's something about driving down the back gravel roads that soothes me. I admit, it can be a little creepy at times. It can be spooky driving in the middle of nowhere, only able to see as far as your headlights allow. The trees hiding whatever could be lurking just beyond your line of vision. What's even scarier is hearing something in the car with you when you know you're alone. Last night, I was looking for a way to calm down after working a stressful 12-hour shift. I got home around 7.30 p.m., made and ate some dinner, then watched TV in bed trying to get some sleep to do it all over again the next day. I tried to sleep for over four hours, tossing and turning, unable to sleep. Sometime past midnight, frustrated, I got out of bed and grabbed my car keys. I stormed out the front door and hopped in my beat-up jeep, speeding out of the driveway. I was angrily muttering to myself about how I can't just roll over and sleep like a normal person. After 10 minutes of driving, I found myself down one of my go-to back roads. It's more of a two-track, surrounded by dense pine trees. I like this road because it's spooky. The trees are dense, you can't see 10 feet into the woods, letting my imagination run wild. I had to slow down to around 25 miles an hour to safely navigate without hitting anything. I turned the radio all the way down, turning my full attention to the thin road in front of me. Just as I started to get that eerie feeling, my car radio blared as loud as it could. A talk radio station had somehow popped on, even though I was listening to 80s rock before. I jumped, scrambling to turn the volume down. Before my hand found the volume knob, the radio cut out completely. I scrunched my eyebrows in confusion, looking at the radio as if it had a mind of its own. All of the sudden, a wave of dread hit me like a ton of bricks. The hair on my arms and neck stood on end my heart beginning to race uncontrollably. It got so quiet I could hear my heartbeat thumping in my ears. After a few seconds of that eerie silence, I started hearing something behind me, in the back seat. It sounded like someone was pushing down into the back seat, like suddenly a lot of weight pushed it down. 
A loud pop made me jump a little, grabbing the steering wheel so tightly my knuckles hurt. I started to feel a presence, like someone or something was in the car with me. I could feel it get closer, like it was leaning in to whisper something in my ear. I noticed movement in my rearview mirror as well. Something was definitely in my back seat. A deep breath exhaled, blowing its breath right in my ear. I was completely paralyzed in fear, not knowing how to react. I was still driving down the road, but maybe at five miles an hour. I was too afraid to turn around and see what was behind me. I had this gut feeling that if I turned around, something bad would happen. Hello. A muffled voice called in my ear. Its voice sent shivers down my spine. It sounded like an old woman, if she were trying to speak while covering her mouth. It started to breathe deep, raspy breaths in my ear, as if it was out of breath and struggling to breathe. Its breath smelt like rotting eggs, making me almost gag. Every now and then, I could see movement in my rearview mirror as it shifted around. Look at me, please. The muffled voice said after a few seconds of breathing down my neck. I ignored it, kept my eyes straight forward. Finally, I could see the driveway about 20 feet ahead to my left. Once I got to it, I pulled in and turned the car around as calmly as I could. Look at me. It growled. My muscles tensed as it spoke. It was even scarier sounding when angry. I managed not to jerk the steering wheel and successfully turned around. I noticed I was driving a little too quickly for the road I was on, but I couldn't help it. I wanted to get back to the main road where there were other people, if I was lucky enough to make it that far. I felt pressure on my shoulder as it must have grabbed me. Its fingers felt incredibly bony and shaky. I stayed driving straight and tried not to let it affect me. There was now jerky movements that I could see in the reflection of the mirror like it was having a seizure or something. The fingers dug into my shoulder, making me wince in pain. Look at me. It growled in my ear again, taking deep breaths in between each word. I noticed my foot consistently pressing the gas pedal harder. I glanced at the speedometer and saw now I was going 50 miles an hour, speeding as I went around turns. I have never wanted out of the backwoods so badly in my life. Somehow, I was able to keep the car in control, avoiding the trees that were just feet from my front end. At one point, my tail end clipped a tree as I slid. I kept driving as fast as I could. Its fingers were digging so hard in my shoulder that it was getting harder to make the turns. Up ahead, I saw the stop sign and I almost cried out in joy. The same cracking noise from earlier rang through the car I could hear the pressure of my back seat leave, as well as the heavy feeling of dread that hung in the air. I didn't even notice I was holding my breath until then, taking a huge breath as I blew through the stop sign. I noticed a tear was rolling down my cheek as well. I could tell by the atmosphere in the air that whatever was in my back seat was now gone. I sped the whole way home, not stopping at any stop signs on the way. I'd never felt so much relief in my life, as I did in that moment, I pulled in my driveway. I slammed the shifter in park and bolted inside, panting heavily. I checked the doors and windows twice before retreating to my room, making sure the whole house was locked up. Needless to say, I didn't get much sleep after that. I sat wondering what that was all night. The next day was a long, horrible 12-hour shift. I was more than thrilled when 7.30 came and I could clock out. I knew I'd struggle sleeping again, but one thing is for sure, I won't be taking a nighttime drive to help me relax. I don't know what that was, but I pray I never encounter it again. I live in the western suburbs of Boston. I realize I'm not exactly in the middle of nowhere, but sometimes it sort of feels like I am. My street is even located between two relatively major roads. However, there's also a lot of farmland in the area, and it's a pretty wooded area too. In fact, 
My backyard is right on the edge of the woods. There's some trails back there that I've explored, as well as a few other trails nearby. There's a few stone walls and old direction markers back there, but other than that, not a whole lot. Due to the fact that I basically live in the woods, I see a lot of animals in my neighborhood. Aside from the standard squirrels, chipmunks, and birds, I tend to see a lot of rabbits, deer, wild turkey, raccoons, and a few possums, and even the occasional fox. However, I've started seeing coyotes in the area, and I'm worried that there might be more to them than they appear. On the other side of the woods from me, there's a house. It's not part of my neighborhood, and I actually think it's another town, since I'm right on the line. During the fall and winter, when the leaves are down, it's very easy to see through the woods to that house, and I notice they tend to keep weird and inconsistent hours. Sometimes the house has every light off as soon as the sun goes down, and sometimes they're up until about 3 a.m. Sometimes I'm just getting up in the morning, someone is leaving for work, and sometimes there's no sign of any movement from there in the mornings. They also have a light on their roof that I later found out is one of those old chicken-shaped weather vanes that for some reason lights up at night. Nothing too unusual about that, except sometimes I see it flashing on and off all night, and sometimes multiple nights in a row. I've never actually spoken to any of the people that live there, and I barely even speak to anyone in my own neighborhood. However, one person who I have spoken to a bit is my next door neighbor, Roger. He's an elderly man, probably in his 70s, and I think he's a widower. He has too much time on his hands, as I often see him doing lots of yard work, even though the neighborhood has a service that does that for us. He's also known to take on projects in other people's yards as well, and do work in communal areas. This includes simple stuff, like taking people's trash cans to the curb, to their garage after the trash pickup has occurred, to larger stuff, such as trimming tree branches. I've joked that he's the unofficial caretaker of the neighborhood. I don't really talk to Roger often, but one time he told me that the people who live in the house on the other side of the woods are Native American. For some reason, I thought that might explain some stuff I've seen in the woods. See, I neglect to mention this before, but there's this crudely made teepee out of branches right off the trail. It's not really big enough for anyone to go into, but it's kind of cool. I have no idea who built it, but it's been back there for at least five years I've lived here. There's some rocks in front of it in a fire pit style, but they seem to change positions sometimes. And I've also seen what looked like beer cans from the 1970s in the vicinity. I wonder if that's when the TP was built. I'm not saying the Native Americans that live in the house are definitely behind the TP, but it wouldn't be out of the realm of possibilities. Some of the old trail stone markers have what could be Native American drawings on them too, but again, anyone could have done that. I don't know whether the Native Americans are responsible for the stuff in the woods or not, but I think they might have something to do with the increased presence of coyotes. As I'm sure many of you are aware, there's a thing called a skinwalker in Native American folklore, in case anyone isn't familiar with them. Supposedly, certain Native Americans can take on the form of an animal by wearing the pelt of their fur. I've typically seen them portrayed as taking the form of wolves or coyotes, but I'm not sure if they're able to take on the form of other mammals too. When I first saw the coyotes, I didn't immediately make the connection. It was late August and I was driving home one evening, just as the sun was starting to set. As I rounded the corner towards my street, I saw what were two coyotes walking down the road. They definitely weren't foxes, and I'm pretty sure wolves don't live around here, so they must have been coyotes. I had never seen a coyote around my house in the five years I've lived here, but I've always suspected they were around. I used to live a few towns over, and I'd occasionally see one there, and more often than not, I'd hear them howling. I actually thought it was kind of cool at first, as I love seeing animals. A few nights later, I was chilling on my back patio when I heard rustling coming from the woods. This wouldn't be the first time an animal in the woods scared me at night time. One time I was in my backyard in October, no doubt having just watched a slasher movie, when I heard what sounded like heavy footsteps in the woods. 
It ended up just being a deer, but as you can imagine, the whole thing was a bit freaky, if only for a little while. This time though, it was a coyote that walked out of the woods. I have no idea if it was one of the ones I had seen earlier in the day, or a different one, but it walked towards my patio and just stood there for a second. I tried to take a picture, but all of a sudden it ran off back into the woods. As I went back inside, I noticed an outline of Roger standing at his back door. I wondered if he was watching the coyote too. I didn't realize this until later, but the outdoor lights of the Native American house had been on the whole time. It was at this point that I made the connection between the coyote and the Native Americans, and I started talking to my friend about the possibility of skinwalkers being in the area. Of course, my friend didn't really take me very seriously, and frankly, I wasn't sure if I took myself seriously. We both like to entertain the possibility of certain aspects of paranormal, including the existence of cryptozoology creatures, like skinwalkers, and related creatures such as flesh gates or the goat man, but lack any concrete evidence. The next day, I saw Roger working in his garden, and I asked him if he had ever seen coyotes in the area. He said not for several years, but he was noticing them coming back. He also warned me to be careful if I saw them and not to get too close as they're prone to attacking. He seemed almost worried as he told me this. That night, I was back on my patio when I started to hear rustling from the woods again. The sounds were coming from various spots in the woods, but I wasn't able to see anything. I then started to hear howling, some sort of noise that sounded like it was very close to me, while others sounded further away. I noticed every single light on at the Native American house on the other side of the woods too, and was wondering if they were behind this after all. Suddenly, I heard what sounded like a loud bang, almost like a gunshot, and the howling stopped, followed by every single light at the house going off at once. I sat there for a few seconds when I noticed Roger standing in his backyard. Get back inside, he told me. What's going on? I asked him. Get back inside, he repeated, offering no explanation. I gathered my things and went back in. I watched out the window for a while and saw Roger standing at the edge of the woods. I realized that he was staring down a coyote. After what felt like hours, but was probably only a few minutes, the coyote turned around and left. Roger stayed there a while longer before going back inside his house. The next day, I tried to get answers, but Roger wouldn't acknowledge what had happened. Several weeks had passed, and I hadn't seen any coyotes or any other odd things going on. By this point, it was early October, and the events in that night in August had become a distant memory. I was coming home from work one evening when I saw Roger out in his garden, like I often did. I waved hello to him, and noticed him waving me over. I won't be able to take care of this neighborhood much longer, he told me. I didn't understand what Roger meant, but he went on to explain that he was planning on moving closer to his children and he just didn't have the strength to take care of the neighborhood anymore. I told him that he could always take it easy, and he didn't have to always be out and doing stuff on the street. But he said that's not what he meant. Roger stuck around for the rest of the fall, but one day in early December, he was gone. I didn't even see any moving trucks. It was as if he had just packed up and left overnight. I did, however, find a note he left taped to my door. The note read, I'm sorry for leaving so abruptly, but it's time for me to go now. I felt myself getting weaker this past summer, and I can't stay here much longer. If you see a coyote, don't engage it. If you can, get indoors immediately. Otherwise, remain perfectly still until it has walked away. Good luck. I thought back to the night in August when the coyotes were coming out of the woods and Roger seemingly scared them off. I know I had always joked about Roger being the unofficial caretaker of the neighborhood, but what if he was actually responsible for protecting it? What if the Native Americans that live in the house on the other side of the woods have some connection to the skinwalkers? Or are skinwalkers themselves? They seem to have some sort of ancient connection to the woods. What if they have the same sort of connection to the land beyond the woods that is my street? What if Roger's physical presence was able to keep the skinwalkers out of the neighborhood? He mentioned he hadn't seen the coyotes in the area in years, 
and seemed worried when he told me about them showing up again. It was almost as if his power to keep the skinwalkers away was somehow weakening, which is why they were able to show up in the area again. I know he was still able to keep them away that night in August, but the fact that they were able to get so close was a bad sign. That must have been what he meant when he said he didn't have enough strength to take care of the neighborhood anymore and that he's getting weaker. Maybe he knew that he'd soon be powerless to stop the skinwalkers and left for his own safety. I've been tossing this theory around for over a month now, but this is the first time I had written it down and read it back to myself. I know it sounds really weird, but the more I think about it, the more I believe it. As much as I like to entertain the existence of the paranormal, I do tend to look for logical explanations for everything, but for this, I have none. The coyotes are getting closer too. I hadn't seen any for a few weeks since Roger left, but on January 10th, it was a full moon. They call that one the wolf moon, because supposedly, wolves tend to howl more at the moon that time of year than others. I didn't hear any wolves, but I heard something howling that night, and it sent shivers down my spine. This past Tuesday, I was driving home from work when I saw a coyote cross the road on the street right before mine. It seemed to be looking directly at me as it walked by. On Friday night, I was coming home from work when I saw a coyote standing right in my driveway. I honked my horn and flashed my lights at it, but it just stood there, staring right at me and growling. There was no way I was getting out of my car and I sat there for about 10 minutes and even contemplated driving away. But eventually, the coyote walked off. Then last night, it was snowing a bit. I turned on the light in my backyard to see how much snow had fallen and how heavy it was snowing when I saw a coyote standing in my backyard. I was able to see the outdoor lights were on at the Native American's house and their weather vane was blinking like crazy again. I quickly turned off the lights and closed the shades. I took a look in my backyard this morning and saw there were paw prints in the snow leading towards the woods. The prints, however, stopped just in front of the entrance of the woods, and sets of human-looking footprints appeared ahead of them. I didn't dare follow them. With Roger, the neighborhood guardian, no longer living here, it seemed like there's nothing that will keep the skinwalkers out. I don't know what will happen, but it's dark out and I hear howling coming from the woods again.